All right, so welcome to the first lecture on the introduction on 3030. So here are the resources for the lecture. As we discussed earlier, we have the uh, videos available uh, on those YouTube links. So those are captured in the last spring 2020 semester. And also we have the videos from Professor Asif Khan who also taught this course before, and he has his own video on those links. So you can have the uh, discussions from different instructors, so you can get different angle of the same problem. And here is the, the scope of the physics of computing. And if you look at the whole stack of the computer system, and we are running the applications on those softwares. And here you have your favorite apps. So those apps are written in software language, and then you need to compile that into the assembly language and then run on the hardware platforms. So on the hardware side, so on the top level, you will have the architectures, for example, the microprocessor architecture, and the well-known von Neumann architecture, where you have the processor and the memory. Processor to compute the logic computation, and then the memory to store the data. So those circuits are implemented eventually by the devices here. And here the building block, as we discussed earlier, is the transistor, and in particular, in this case, it's a MOSFET transistor. And then, if you want to look into the transistor, what made of the transistor is actually the silicon material, because all the transistor today is a silicon transistor. And silicon here will show the crystal structure of the silicon. You see those atoms. This is uh, the fundamentals of the computing. Electrons are going to flow through the silicon, and this is the foundations of all the computing you are running on top of that. So here, you see it's 3030 is going to cover the stacks on the bottom part from the silicon material to the building block that is the transistor, and then to a simple circuit like the inverter. So those are the foundations uh, for the software you are running on top of that. And uh, if you look at the computing hardware platforms, here we see some examples. Of course, you are familiar with CPU, Central Processing Unit. And here we have one example from Intel, Core i7. So this is one of the popular uh, processors for your, for example, your laptop, and also workstations. So CPU, you know, is uh, for generic computation. So you can run any programs on the CPU. So it's very flexible in terms of the programming. But recently we see the industry is moving away from CPU to other computing platforms for more specific workloads. For example, here we see the GPU, graphic processing unit. And uh, you know, one of the famous vendors for GPU is NVIDIA. So originally the GPU was designed for uh, graphic processing, especially in the gaming applications. Um, but recently, the GPU is also widely used for machine learning artificial intelligence workloads because of the parallel computation capability offered by the GPU. So we offload some of the computing nodes from the CPU to GPU because GPU is better in the parallel computation to accelerate those applications. And then from GPU, if you want to move further, 
Then recently there is a, a trend to develop this PPU plus the other lens and XPU, NPU, whatever PU. So here the TPU is one example from Google. This is for tensor processing units. And you may think that Google is a software company or internet company. But actually Google has a very large hardware design team who develop its own chips. And the TPU is just one example. So Google's TPU is specialized in machine learning workloads. So Google is using that in its data center to do the, for example, your image recognition or the language translation. Those workloads are all run on the TPU. And if you recall the famous the Go game, uh, where the Google's uh, DeepMind uh, Go Master uh, defeat the world champion from Korea, the software programs are running on a cluster of TPU of the Go game. So the TPU is uh, used for specialized workloads, especially for the machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So this is a general trend uh, because those specialized hardware is more efficient in those matrix operations. Because as you may aware, those machine learning algorithms are essentially matrix uh, operations. You have the matrix, matrix multiplication. So those hardware is designed for those operations. Unlike CPU, CPU is more generic uh, general computing. So you can do anything on CPU, but it may not be that efficient for those matrix operations. So this is a general trends in the computing hardware platforms today. Let me see if there's any questions from the chat. No? If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and uh, you can unmute yourself directly or if you feel shy, then you can type in your question here. So I do anticipate more interactions with you. All right, so let's go back here. So if you look at the whole semiconductor industry uh, in the past five decades, uh, actually it's following this Moore's law you may have heard of this Morse law before. So basically, this was a prediction made by Golden Moore, this gentleman here. He is the co-founder of Intel. And uh, back in 1965, he predicted that the number of transistors on the processor is going to exponentially increase over the years. And the prediction was that the number of transistor will double every two years. Or in other words, if you think about the size of each transistor, then it will scale by the factor of 0.7x. Why 0.7? Because if the area reduced by half, then if you think, the, think about the two-dimensional or oh, let's say a square, if the area reduced by half, then each side of the square is going to reduce by 0.7, because 0.7 times 0.7 is 0.49, which is about 50%, half. So the size of each transistor scales by 0.7x, or in other words, the area of each transistor scale by 0.5. That means the number of transistor on the same area, the same chip area, is going to double every two years. So this historical trend uh, basically collects the data from the uh, well-known processors in the history, from the old, old days, like those 8080s, and also the Pentan series. And then to the recent, uh, the core i3, i5, i7. So you see that the exponential increase 
in the transistor count. So today, actually, it reaches more than like a billion transistors on chip. Still, more snow is uh, alive until today, but we do see that the industry is uh, uh, facing the difficulties to maintain the more snow in the coming years. And if you read the news uh, and, uh, recently, Intel delayed their 7 nanometer processor from this year to the next year. So we do see the challenges in the scaling, and we will discuss what are the challenges later in this course. So we do see a slowdown of the more snow, but till today, the historical trend is still valid. So what is the driving force for this more snow? Any ideas? So actually it's not because of the technology, uh, technological reason, actually it's the economic, uh, economic reason. The reason is that if you can have more transistor on the same chip area, then for the same functionality, you can reduce the chip area by half every two years. That means you are going to spend the same amount of money to fabricate double number of chips. So the cost per chip is going to reduce over the years. That's why you see the, uh, today those chips are becoming cheaper and cheaper. For example, if you think about the, your USB drive, like uh, five years ago, uh, like one dollar maybe can buy 10 gigabytes. Today, one dollar maybe can buy like uh, 50 gigabytes. So this is because the chip can be smaller. So this is the driving force for the more snow. At the same time, we will see later that you can boost the performance when you scale the transistor's dimensions as well. So you get the economic benefits and also the performance boost. So here we show the MOSFET, the transistor dimension scaling in terms of the gate lengths. So we'll talk about the structure of the transistor in more details later. But here you just think that here this L gate, the gate length is the, let's say is the feature size of the transistor. It's an indicator of the dimension of one device. And this L gate follows this more snow scaling very well. And uh, in the 1980s, the dimension is about 3 micrometer. But today, if you look at the latest technology offered by, for example, TSMC or Intel, the dimension is about 10 nanometer or even below that. So this is a very aggressive scaling. If you want to visualize this scaling, so here we can see the uh, cartoon here. So this is a, a device at 3 micrometer load back in 1980s. So this is the size of the transistor you can see. And if we scale the device to today's like 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer, then the device actually is like this. Uh, I don't know if you can see that on the slide or not. So here, let me have the pointer. So then if you scale the dimension in proportion to this scaling trend, then the device will become such small. So this is the power of the scaling. And if you look at the numbers here, so here we have the year, and also we have the technology node, which is a representative number to uh, capture the dimension of that technology node. And uh, today, uh, we have the 7 nanometer process from the TSMC, which is the leading manufacturing facility in Taiwan. And uh, 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 we are going to have 5 nanometer process very soon uh, from TSMC, I think uh, already, maybe the later 
in the second half of this year or next year, we will see a lot of five nanometer per, uh, chips. So this is a very aggressive scaling over the uh, past few decades. And then you may wonder, what is a nanometer? Right. So nanometer, you know, is 10 to the minus nine meter. Okay. So here we show the scale bar for different subjects. And uh, you can visualize maybe from your eye, you can see maybe a pencil tip is about this 10 to the power six nanometer. You can translate that to be one millimeter. So this is what you can see. And uh, below that, you have to use microscope, for example. And those biomedical, um, biological, uh, like those virus, including the virus, is on the order of like a, uh, 100 nanometer to one micrometer scale. And our device, that's transistor, actually is smaller than that. It's on the order of 10 nanometer today. So you see here, we are on the order of 10 nanometer. So it's much smaller than those virus. And then if you consider the atoms, okay, like the molecules or the atoms, then it's on the order of a few angstrom to one nanometer. Or in other words, our device today from one dimension, there are only like maybe a dozens of atoms from one side of the transistor to the other side of the transistor. So it's pretty small. And this is a, a, a fundamental challenge for the scanning. So that's why you see the more snow is uh, snowing down. This is because the industry is going to hit a limit of the physics because you cannot have only a few atoms. It's very hard to control that. So that's why the scaling is slowing down today. Any questions? I got one question, okay. Is TSM says the only semiconductor manufacturer that has the seven nanometer technology? Uh, so if you read the news, Intel supposed to deliver their seven nanometer processor this year, but delayed to the next year. So the TSMC right now is a leading um, company. But uh, also I think uh, Samsung has seven nanometer process as well. But the market share is not as large as uh, TSMC. So Samsung is the second one who has uh, seven nanometer process. But uh, uh, TSMC is moving towards five nanometer in this year already. So that's the status of the uh, chip manufacturers. Okay, I got one more question. Are the very high-end manufacturing technologies like the 7 nanometer one used for consumer applications or industry scientific applications only? Uh, so I think uh, the advanced technology nodes like 7 nanometer or beyond are used for both, for both consumer applications and industrial and scientific applications. And actually it's more driving by the consumer electronics. Uh, for example, TSM says one big customer is Apple, actually. So you, your latest iPhones uh, are always using the TSM says latest technology. So the consumer electronics is a big driving force. All right, any other questions? If no, then let's move on. So let's see one real example uh, of the processor. So this is from Intel, a uh, 14 nanometer CPU. This uh, has a brand name Broadwell. This was introduced by, uh, in 2014. So here we show a cross-sectional view of the chip under the microscope. So as we know, it's very small, so we have to use microscope to see the cross-sectional view. Cross-sectional means what? Means you, let's say, get a chip and let's say cut, cut into half 
and then you look at the chip from the side side view. So this is the cross-sectional view of the chip. And uh, here the, on the bottom, it's called the substrate, and uh, it's made of semiconductor. semiconductor. And in this case, it's silicon. So that's why we need to learn the silicon properties in this course, because all the chips are made of the silicon substrate. And if you zoom in here, you will see one individual transistor. It's pretty small here. This box, if you zoom in, then you will see the one transistor, in this case, MOSFET structure. Actually, here are two transistors. Um, but on top of that, uh, we have many layers here. So what is that? Those layers are metal wires. So this is the interconnect. Because from one transistor to another transistor, or let's say one circuit module to another circuit module, we have to go through the routing by those wires from one part of the chip to another part of the chip. And because the routing is so complicated, you cannot finish the routing within one layer. You have to use multiple layers to basically uh, route the signals. And here you may have more than 10 layers of the interconnect. So here the lighter color is the metal. And then you will see some darker color between those metal metal wires. Those are the oxides. So basically this is the insulator between the metals because you have to prevent the circuit between two wires. So you have to fill in with the oxide to insulate. So this is the cross-sectional view of the real chip. And uh, you see that we have different uh, materials used in the chip. On the bottom, we have the silicon substrate, which is semiconductor, and we have the metal wires to conduct the routing, and then we have oxide to insulate the wires. Any questions here? Okay, by the way, so as I said earlier, so I have the comments uh, on each slide, uh, in, uh, so, so you can view this uh, to understand the content of each slide after the class. And next, uh, I will show a video from Intel uh, to illustrate how a chip is being made. This is for Intel's 22 nanometer process. So let me play this on the YouTube, and you will see how a chip is being made actually from the sand. Why is sand? So I will tell you in a minute. So hopefully you can see the, see the YouTube. All right, so let me see. I need a feedback. Can you see the YouTube? Yes, okay, good. Let's go back. Okay, so I will discuss how a chip is being made. So first, you see this is a sand, white sand, you know, sand from the beach, for example. This is because sand is mostly silicon dioxide. This is a primary source we can get the silicon from on Earth. So the job here is to purify the silicon from the sand. This is the first step in the manufacturing. So what you can do is to melt this, and then you can purify the silicon into this cylinder. So this cylinder is made of pure silicon. And then you are going to cut the silicon into these wafers. So this one piece of the 
silicon is called wafer, W-A-F-E-R, wafer. So this is like a pizza. It's actually 12 inch pizza, okay, this days. 300 millimeter in the diameter, so 12 inch. And this is the substrate for your chips. You are going to make many, many chips on this wafer. So this wafer will go through the same manufacturing process and then after it's done, you will get like tens of thousands chips at one time. Okay, and then you get the silicon substrate wafers. You uh, spin on some silicon, oh, sorry, photoresist, which are the chemicals, which are light in, uh, sensitive. So those chemicals is to protect the surface of the silicon. And then this is one important step called uh, lithography. So the job of this is to, let me uh, stop here. So this is to transfer the pattern from this mask to the surface of the silicon. Because you need to define the geometry uh, or the patterns of your devices and the interconnect between devices. So there are some patterns, for example, your circuit uh, wiring or the device locations. So you have those patterns predefined by the software, uh, by the CAD tool, the computer aided design, CAD CAD tool. So the circuit designers, for example, what the, if you are an engineer of Apple, for example, you design your iPhone, let's say this Apple A12 processor, so your final job is to deliver a mask, the layout of the mask. And then this mask information is going to be transferred to, for example, TSMC. And TSMC is going to manufacture this mask. And then we are going to use the light to transfer the pattern from the mask to the surface of the silicon. So this is called the lithography step, lithol step. Um, and then after the lithography step is done, then because the photoresist is a chemical which is sensitive to the light exposure, so the locations where you have the light exposure will be dissolved in the solvent. So then you can use that as a, a pattern on the chip to further define the geometry of the devices on the silicon surface. So this is a way to transfer the pattern from the mask to the pattern on the silicon surface. So any questions? So we don't require this manufacturing process in this course. Here is just for your information and how if you wonder how a chip is manufactured. Of course, this is a very simplest way to describe this. There is actually a, a, a course on this manufacturing and process, I think it's a 4,000 uh, ECE course. Okay, so then let's uh, continue. So after that, uh, you will have the silicon uh, wafers uh, being, let's say, doped with some other impurities. And this is called doping process, which is important. So here you see something is uh, uh, depositing on the surface of the silicon. This is, uh, uh, let's say, for the doping process. We're going to discuss that in the lecture three or lecture four in this course. This is to basically add the impurity element into the silicon to make it more conductive. And uh, 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 we are going to discuss why we need that later in lecture three or lecture four. Uh, but we need to add something into the silicon. So now the silicon is not pure silicon anymore. So it's a silicon with impurity. And then after that, then we are going to etch out some silicon, remove some something, remove some remove some silicon, and then deposit some metals uh, to make the contact for the transistor. For example, this is a gate contact, and then we make the source and the drain contact. So you have three contacts with the transistor in this case. So there are many multiple steps for the deposition and the re uh, etching to remove. You add something and remove something 
basically. And then after that, we need to deposit the copper, which is a metal material for the interconnect. So this is for the wiring. So we use copper to make the wires. So those are the metal contacts. Of course, then we just show one transistor here. But if you think about the whole wafer, all the transistors will go through the same manufacturing steps. So you have many, many of them. So on the one wafer, you have billions, more than billions uh, transistors. And now you need to go through those multiple layers for the interconnect to finish the routing. So this is a, a very complicated routing process. You have to do this layer by layer. It's not like this animation here, but you have to do it layer by layer. So think about the whole wafer. You have very, very complicated routing. And then on the whole wafer, we have so many blocks. So each block is one chip, or sometimes we call it one die. So for example, one processor, one CPU is one block here. You have so many blocks on one chip. So that's why you can manufacture maybe thousands of chips at the same time. So this is a way to save the manufacturing cost. Uh, because no matter how, if you can make the chip smaller, then on the same wafer, this 12 inch pizza, you can have more chips, so you can sell more units. So that's how you make money. So then we need to cut the wafers into those individual chips. So for example, this is one processor chip, and then you need to put that on the package on the circuit board. And then before you sell to the market, you have to uh, do the testing to check its functionality, reliability, and uh, 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 check the specs of the chip. And eventually then you can put on the market. So this is, uh, of course, advertisement from Intel. Uh, any questions? Okay, I got one question. Why a wafer, not a square? Oh, this is a very good question. Uh, I don't have a direct answer to that, but I think the way uh, when they manufacture this cylinder, uh, yeah, actually I don't know this 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 answer. Yeah. So so so, uh, but uh, in industry is always like the wafer, like a pizza. It's a uh, a. Uh, 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 from let's say 4 inch to 8 inch to today's 12 inch but uh, uh, no one asks why not a square but then there must be a reason uh, I apologize I, 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 did, I didn't know this reason okay so this is uh, the process for the manufacturing of a chip and this is not required in this course this is just for your broader interest. Let's go back to the nice. So the last topic I want to discuss today is on this uh, processor's clock frequency. So here you see we have a historical trend uh, of the clock frequency of the microprocessor uh, from 1980s. To 2010. So here you see that the clock frequency keep increasing over the generations till 2005. And uh, here you see that the clock frequency reach about 3000 megahertz, which is about 3 gigahertz. And then after that, it gets saturated. And if you look at the specs of your processor, for example, in your laptop or in your smartphone, you will find out the clock frequency is generally around, let's, let's say, 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz. So no more increase. Why is that? Why is that? Have you ever asked this question? Why is that? So to understand this trend, we need to also look at another metric, which is the power density. So for each chip, it's running the power consumption. 
in the unit of watt. And if you look at the chip area, then you can normalize that using watt per centimeter square of the chip area. So this is a power density. So if you draw the power density as a function of this year, you will see similar trend. Uh, the power density keep increasing till 2005. Then we reach this uh, 100 watt per centimeter square, and then it saturates. So if you want to link the power density to the clock frequency, you will find out the reason why we cannot further increase the clock frequency because we hit a limit of the power density. Because if you run more power on the chip, then the chip will become hot due to the heat dissipation. If you cannot remove the heat efficiently, then your chip will become more and more a higher temperature. So here, if we can, let's say, if we project this trend, if we do nothing, okay, keep increasing the clock frequency, for example, then soon the chip will reach the temperature where it is like the rocket nozzle or even some surface. So this is, of course, impossible. So we have to limit the chip power density to around this 100 watt per centimeter square, which will translate to about 3 gigahertz. So this is uh, due to the heat dissipation. And actually right now my laptop's fan is running. I don't know why. Every time when I run this blue gen, then the CPU uh, becomes hot, and then the fan has to be uh, turned on. So this is for a laptop, but if you if you think about the data center where you have clusters of the processors, the the data center needs to manage the uh, cooling through the air conditioning. So this is to prevent the heat to the chip because once you heat up the chip, then the reliability will become worse, and it's easier to make errors. Uh, when you do the computation, when you have higher temperature. Okay, if you look at the metrics for evaluating the computer system, so we care about how fast the processor runs. So this is uh, uh, by the clock frequency. But we know that we cannot further increase clock frequency because of the power dissipation. And uh, we care about how hot the chip may become. This will lead to the fine noise reliability issues. And in terms of reliability, it basically says how often does it make mistakes. So we have the noise margin before we, uh, so we have some tolerance of the uh, noise, but we cannot exceed this margin. So we will discuss that uh, later for the inverter. So this will determine the error rate of your data. So all of those needs to be considered when you design a hardware platform. Any questions? One question from the chat. So faster clock frequency requires high power? Yes, simply speaking, yes. Uh, later you will see that even you use a simple circuit like inverter, you will find out the dynamic power is proportional to the clock frequency. So this is generally true for the digital circuit. And we will derive the equations for that later in the course. Okay, one final remark on the volume architecture. You may have learned this before. So this is a typical architecture for today's computer system where you have a processor. On the processor's chip, you may have this ALU, arithmetic logic unit, where you can do the multiply or you can do the accumulation, you can do all kinds of logic. Uh, but you need the control unit 
to send the instruction to the computing unit. And also, you may have to use this cache made of the S-RAN cells to store the intermediate data. For example, you have two numbers multiplied with each other, and then the product needs to be stored in the cache uh, uh, for the usage in the next uh, block cycle. So you need some cache memory for that. So this is on the processor's chip. Sometimes we call it on chip. And then if you look at logic unit, it's made of logic gates, like the land gates, log gates, or a very basic inverter. And the inverter is made of two transistor, and transistor is made of silicon. And off the chip, you have separate one memory module. For example, we have the DRAM and dynamic random access memory, or we have the flash memory, your SSD, solid state drive. This is because the memory, like the DRAM or the SRAM, will lose the data after you power off your chip. If you want to maintain the data for a long time, then you need to use this flash memory, which is your SSD or the data to return. So we are going to discuss all the red building blocks shown in this graph in this course, like the silicon material, the transistor, the basic inverter for the logic gates, and the interconnect that is the wires between the modules and the memory units, like the SRAM cache, uh, DRAM memory, and the flash for the SSD storage. So this is uh, the scope of this course. And once you learn that, you will have a very solid foundations for the computer system. Any questions? Uh, one good question from the chat. Is the BIOS also stored in the flash memory? Uh, so this is a very good question. So the BIOS uh, is stored in flash memory. That's, uh, the, the, the answer is yes. But this flash memory is different from your, uh, let's say, your solid state drive, where you have your large capacity, like terabytes uh, 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 drive. So this uh, flash memory, there is a very small capacity flash memory on the processor, which may be only kilobytes, just to to store the BIOS information to boot up the system. This is a very small capacity flash memory on the uh, uh, on the chip. That is correct. But this flash memory is different from the flash memory in your solid state drive, which is a, a separate uh, uh, module, a separate chip. So so this is a little bit different. Any other question before we end up today's lecture? Okay, if not, then I will stop here and uh, we will post the videos uh, to the YouTube if you want to review any materials. And I would appreciate your feedback. If you have any suggestions, um, send me an email, and I would appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.